Welcome everybody, uh, and it's good to see people both in person, and we've been looking at the, the screen and seeing so many people dialing in on the first Royal Aeroquist Society Bedford Branch hybrid event. So we have people in person and seeing people online. First of us, uh, we are really lucky today to have Doug, Dr. Doug Greenwell coming in to talk to us about the renaissance of the transonic wind tunnel. Now, Okay. Doug has been in the industry okay. for 35 right. years. Uh, moved closer, like, uh, <laughs> uh, with starting with a doctorate from Bath University, uh, then going on to be a researcher in various posts in, in okay. industry, no, academia, uh, and also in government as well. So quite a varied set of things. He's an associate director at SGO part-time currently, and he's... Uh, been, I think, chief technologist or chief of the Max system. Yep, at, at ARA. So, without much more ado, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Doug. Okay, there we go. Oh, good evening, everyone, or um, good morning, I think, in uh, in some parts of the world for some of my audience. Um, I'm tell you, my name's Doug Greenwell. Um, I'm uh, giving this uh, this talk into my uh, kind of personal uh, capacity as a consultant aerodynamicist. Uh, and just to briefly. Give you some background. This came out. Well, I was recently asked to uh, write a review paper for the Aeronautical Journal. It's their 125th anniversary uh, publication next year. That's quite an achievement for an aero journal. Um, and uh, I was asked to write something on their trans on industrial wind tunnel testing. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about tonight kind of came out of uh, of some of the the background uh, kind of study I did on that, looking at not just the tunnels themselves, but also how many they are, where they are, what people are doing with them. So what I'm going to talk about, start off with just some brief definitions. Um, a lot of the local members are not necessarily uh, wind tunnel engineers, so I will cover some things that are kind of uh, perhaps basic for some of you and uh, others there. Um, talk a bit then about, well, what's the demand for a transonic wind tunnel and uh, relate that to the kind of current supply of transonic wind tunnels if you want to think about them as a commodity. Um, get into a bit more detail about who's doing what and where and when with their transonic wind tunnels, um, new builds, reactivations, uh, funding programs. Uh, and then I'll uh, move from the kind of global picture down into the UK picture and talk a little bit about that. And I'll just go back up there. Just a, a quick disclaimer anyhow, this is my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of any organization I'm currently working for or have worked for in the, in the recent past. This is uh, it's all opinions of my own. So uh, I'm happy to have a discussion about them, but uh, it, it's not, not any responsibility of any of my managers or previous managers. So first of all, transonic wind tunnels. What is a transonic tunnel? Well, the obvious question is, answer is it's a, a tunnel that operates in a transonic regime. Let's say 0.72 to 1.3, 1.4 Mach number. My suit, this is still really the most challenging flow regime, both for computational fluid dynamics and for experimental fluid dynamics. Um, defining feature of a transonic wind tunnel is that the test section is ventilated. And this can either be typically perforated um, walls or slotted walls, perforated with our normal or, or, or angled holes, slotted walls of variations of their uh, kind of profiles or straight slots. Um, these can range from relatively low porosities, 3% up to 20% for some of the older facilities. Uh, that really will depend on the age of the tunnel, the particular wall configuration of that tunnel, and also the kind of test you're doing in that tunnel. So wall porosities can vary depending on whether you're doing 2D testing, full span testing, uh, a number of other aspects there. And that test section is then surrounded by a plenum chamber uh, providing pressure control there. Why do you want to ventilate a test section? Well. The classic one that everyone gets told at university is it stops the flow choking around uh, a model in the test section. So um, you've got some blockage in the test section. You don't want to get uh, local sonic flow around that as you get close to uh, the transonic flow regime. But there's a lot of other useful things that vent ventilation does for you. You can use it to set or adjust Mach number at low supersonic conditions. Um, it was a little bit of a surprise to me when I first came into high-speed wind tunnel testing that actually you don't necessarily need a nozzle to go supersonic. And a number of tunnels, particularly, for example, um, the NTF doesn't have a flexible nozzle at all. It just has a, a, a sonic uh, nozzle and you go supersonic up to 1.3, 1.4, uh, 
just on flow through the side walls of the test section. You can use it to uh, reduce or some people will claim to eliminate wall corrections at subsonic conditions. Uh, there are a number of tunnels where in fact, they don't even bother applying corrections to the data uh, in subsonic conditions on the assumption that the walls will sort it all out for you. And similarly, at low supersonic conditions, you can uh, reduce or eliminate reflections from the walls so you get better flow quality. So you've got a nice little sweet spot in between 0.7 and 1.4 where you really can't do anything useful with solid walls. And you've then got an inflow and outflow from the test section, which is controlled by essentially the pressure in the plenum chamber around it. And that then can be controlled passively with their usually diffuser suction. You use a low pressure in the diffuser to suck air out of the plenum, or you stick a whacking big compressor on it and you suck it out with a, uh, in the case of AI, for example, a 10,000 horsepower um, compressor, which is pretty much half the power of the main drive. They're not small bits of a kit. There's a lot of energy in these systems. And just to sort of, you know, what kind of things are people still doing with them um, transonic wind tunnels? Current civil aircraft, we're looking at conventional wing aerodynamics, airframe modifications, podded propulsion systems, stability control, high lift work. Military aircraft, transonic performance, unsteady aerodynamics, buffeting, that sort of thing, panel loads for design, stability control for maneuverability, wing aerodynamics, external stores, carriage and release. Intake performance, jet effects, and um, propulsion jet interactions with the rest of the airframe. For, um, let's just catch up with myself here. There we go. Future civil aircraft. There's one of the Airbus ones there. A lot more work on off design performance. Older civil aircraft, you tended to focus on cruise conditions. Off design performance, much more highly integrated propulsion systems, unconventional configurations, um, and aeroacoustics. And on the military side, more unconventional configurations. Maneuverability making a welcome return for some reason, not entirely sure why, to be honest, but uh, uh, having uh, stopped doing that sort of thing 20 odd years ago, it seems to have reappeared. Um, weapons bay aerodynamics, internal uh, weapon stowage and getting weapons out of bays is a real issue at Transonics and obviously advanced weapon systems as well. Uh, so space is also an application, not particularly a uh, big one here in the UK. The interesting thing is that actually, although I said this is current and future, almost all of this has been pretty much bread and butter work for test engineers for 30 or 40 years. We've been doing pretty much these things in transonic wind tunnels for almost as long as they've existed. Um, they, I mean, unconventional configurations were back around the loop with blended wing bodies, back around the loop with internal weapons bay. These things come and go, so they're not necessarily new, but what you are seeing is kind of emphasis, shift in emphasis away from a lot of... Um, Kind of handle turning database generation uh, in SNC and performance into um, a more, acquiring more detailed understandings of the flow physics. Uh, and that's kind of also been impacted by rapid increases in data productivity in, in modern wind tunnels, improved instrumentation, and uh, an increasing kind of complementary use of CFD and DFD. Uh, but there is a major challenge here, which is that. Yes, we've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and we tend to have been doing it with the same wind tunnels for 30, 40 years. So loss or degradation of existing capabilities has become a bit of a challenge in some places. And just a, a very quick example of the kind of things for those who aren't familiar with the sort of things you are doing in the transonic tunnel. That's just whizzed through much faster than I was expecting. Um, we've got a bunch of rigs there. I won't spend too much time on this because otherwise I've run out of time, but it's just an example of the the size and complexity and um, diverseness of experimental investigations that you, um, you see happening in um, transonic wind tunnels. Some particularly interesting ones are kind of dynamic testing, propulsion integration, intake testing, jet effects, um, dynamic testing, air elastic testing, a very wide range of test activities in these big facilities. Now, moving on from wind tunnels, um, what we use them for is, just to talk briefly about sizes of transonic tunnels, right? coming from this from the industrial side of things. Um, and I prefer to classify tunnels literally by their size, by the reference length, square root of the cross section of the test section. Reason for that is um, I've already said they're mapped the transonic, so I don't really need the Mach number capability. Reynolds number capability, it really it depends on what pressure and temperature you're going to run the at. You can plot Reynolds number, Mach number plots to your heart's content, and they never look the same. They're not that helpful. But the size of a tunnel 
really translates straight into how complex it is to operate, what you can do in it, how much it costs to operate. So it's kind of the major um, element, I think, in, in, a large, in a transonic facility is how big is it? Um, and some examples. Catch up. There we go. We can start off with small research facilities. This is the ARAZ4, it's a nine inch transonic tunnel. You can move on up to mid-range industrial tunnels. This is the ADC 4T, which is a four foot test section. Um, you can move on up to large industrial tunnels, kind of typically nine foot. Apologies to the, uh, to the metric speakers. Wind tunnels, I tend to think in, in feet and, uh, and measurements in, metri in, in SI units. It's just a natural mix. Um, and or you can even go up to the very large industrial tunnel. Oh, that's an extreme size there. And to me, the test engineer is a physically significant reference length for a wind tunnel. And our basic criteria is if you can get into the test section, it's an industrial tunnel. If you can stand up, it's a large industrial tunnel. And as you can see, this poor chap at 40, he's on his knees working on that model. Whereas at ARA, um, we can stand next to the model and have nice photographs taken uh, of proud customers. So looking at typical kind of transonic facilities, I said, I'm going to focus on, on industrial because there's a lot of small research facilities there and not, to be honest, from my point of view, particularly interesting. Uh, we'll come back to that. We've said they're bigger than four feet. So what I've done here is I've plot, plotted maximum Mach number against size just to get a rough idea of the kind of, of, of spread of, of types of wind tunnel. This is pretty much all the transonic industrial tunnels in the world on that plot there. Um, and what you see is you, you end up with finger trouble for a start. Well, let's have a go, a go at that. You end up with um, two kind of classes of workhorse tunnels. Firstly, your mid-range trisonic blowdowns. These are tunnels with about a four to five foot test section. will run from subsonic up to typically max three to five, probably faster than that. And they're blowdown tunnels, so they're intermittent at short run times. Um, and you can see we've got a lot of those sitting down here um, in the kind of one, 1 1.2 meter size, three to five, uh, max three to five. And then the other kind of classic transonic industrial tunnel is the larger continuous tunnel. So a uh, eight, nine foot Mac 1.6, 1.8 continuous running tunnel. So transonic rather than trisonic. And you can see these two groups there. We'll come back to that in a little bit. And two examples there. One is there, the Canadian NRC 1.5 meter. I always used to call it the five foot, but it's now metric. It's the 1.5 meter tunnel there. And we have JAXA's two meter. Um, continuous transonic tunnel as examples of those two classes. Um, so those are the kind of wind tunnels you might see. Next question then is, well, what's the demand for them? Why do we need them? How many do we need? And you can think of demand in terms of uh, so user occupancy hours. How many hours do you need in a wind tunnel for a particular program? Um, and then within that hour, you can think about the productivity. How many data points or in wind tunnels, how many traverses or polars can you do in that hour that you're in your very expensive wind tunnel. Um, uh, let's see, apologize for the glitches here. This is coming, it's come back up. Right, put them the other way. What you see, this is wind tunnel hours per test program against time, for civil aircraft, military aircraft, and one or two projects at the end there. But what is remarkable is that you start off with the Wright brothers back here at about 30 hours testing in 19. 19 over something or other, and 120 years later, that's quite a, a thought really, we're back up at say 20,000 hours on average and a bit more per program there. And you can see in this a very rapid increase in, um, in kind of tunnel usage for aircraft as we went into World War II and the early, early years of the Cold War. But then it leveled out. You see hours per program leveling out but in the 70s. But interestingly, if you look at productivity, around about then, as our right-hand plot there, that's polos per hour, against you, about 1960, you started to see productivity going up. There's a huge scatter here because it really just depends on what you're doing in the tunnel, what kind of a tunnel it is. But this is a rough idea from a number of different facilities is that you've gone from kind of one or two poles an hour to potentially five to 10 to 12, depending on what you're doing. So massive increases in data productivity at about the time people stopped or leveled off needing so many hours. So you could imagine the actual data points per program has carried on going up. The interesting thing here is about the point it leveled off is about the point CFD started to be seen as a useful tool. 
And it's also about the point that people started saying we're not going to need wind tunnels in 10 years' time. That's, I think, our, uh, <coughs> Nigel Taylor pointed this one out in one of his presentations. Thank you very much, Nigel, for that. SP347 in 1976, wind tunnels will be secondary by 1985. Uh, well, that didn't happen, and it has carried on not happening, thank goodness. So, from my point of view, looking at that kind of picture, the demand has, has leveled, but it's still there. It hasn't changed much in the last 30 or 40 years, which is really rather surprising. Um, but then we look at, well, what's the, um, what's the supply? What, what kind of wind tunnels have we got? How many have we got? And we'll start off, I'll split this into continuous and intermittent. So start with continuous tunnels, continuous running, closed return circuits, very high installed power, generally transonic and low supersonic. So up to say 1.7, 1.8. Um, and that, ex that excludes supersonic tunnels, purely supersonic tunnels with solid walls. Um, and this is size of tunnel plotted against time, against entry into service, to get how things have changed. So you can see um, the, the fill symbols are tunnels that are still running, the red symbols, the open ones are tunnels that have been closed. But you can see there's great big activity in the early years of their, the tunnels then. But things have carried on. People are still building continuous tunnels. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, what you do see is that most of these continuous tunnels are operated by kind of national research organizations, are big and expensive to run, very few airframers, you could possibly argue AVIC with FL62 is an airframer, but it's also a government body, so in a way, um, they're mostly government owned and run. Um, there's a couple of interesting ones. We have the Transonic Dynamics Tunnel, it's a heavy gas tunnel for, um, uh, for matching your um, kind of structural uh, scaling. We've got a couple of cryogenic tunnels, NTF and ETW, built there in the 80s and 90s, but uh, that's the last time anybody's really done that at this scale. And we have our two commercial facilities back there in the, in the, um, the mid-50s, ARA and CalSpan, are the only two kind of privately run transonic wind tunnels. Well, you could probably argue Boeing and a couple of those there, but they're not open to the general public to come and do their testing in them. So that's continuous tunnels, supply of that. Intermittent tunnels on the other side of this. So these are generally open return, generally blow down, um, run times between minutes and sometimes seconds. So obviously you've got to work a lot harder to get, uh, to get data out of them. Generally trisonic. So although they're uh, much lower data productivity, you've got that um, speed range right away from subsonic to, to a decent supersonic uh, capability. Um, and if you look at these, Test section size against time, you can see A, they're generally quite a lot smaller. B, they're spread pretty much right across the last 60, 70 years. Those continuous tunnels have carried on being built. Sorry, those intermittent tunnels. People are still building them. Uh, and there's not that so many of them have been closing. There we go. And again, these, because they're smaller, a bit cheaper to operate, they're operated by a mix of national research organizations and airframers. So there's a lot more aircraft companies that have their own blow down trisonic wind tunnel. Now, putting them all together, we've got continuous and intermittent on this plot. You can start to see some features appearing. It's a bit of a starry, starry night plot, but there are some things in there you can see. Um, you can kind of categorize them by size. And what you tend to see is you get a lot of small research facilities. 0.1 meter up to one meter, university research organization based facilities called small research. In between that, we have the mid range intermittent tunnels. So these are the four foot, five foot industry blow down facilities. Um, we then move on up to large continuous transonic tunnels, ARA being an example of that. And then you've got this little group here of the very large tunnels. But basically, be, quite a few of them were built in the very early years, and nobody's done that again in the last 50 years. These things are going right up to S1MA there at the top at something like eight meters. You can also look in terms of time. There have been essentially I've asked, three generations of transonic tunnels. You can look at the post-war pioneers from the invention of the slotted and perforated wall in the mid 40s, depending who you talk to, they'll argue about who actually invented it. Um, but somewhere in the mid 40s, people started well, modifying existing tunnels, most of the very early ones were big supersonic, big subsonic, say Mach 0.6 tunnels that people then souped up, put slotted balls or perforated balls into to turn them into transonic tunnels. And an awful lot of activity people building or modifying these very large facilities. The technology is like kind of stabilized by the, um, the 60s, the mid 60s. 
Um, and then, another 20 years later, in the 80s, you started these kind of second generation tunnels coming along. Cryogenic facilities, tunnels with them, uh, more rigorously designed test section porosities. So as we said, despite those porosities being designed with the best computing power, they still ended up modifying them empirically over a period of a year or two in the early days of commissioning tunnels. And that's still happening now with some of the new Chinese tunnels. They've still gone around the loop several times modifying uh, an apparently uh, theoretically designed test section. There's a bit of an interregnum here. The hard days of the mid 90s into the 2005 when people started closing wind tunnels um, fairly frequently. And then in the last 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years or so, we're seeing a bunch of new wind tunnels being built. So we've got a third generation uh, of, of tunnels coming along. So that's kind of tunnels by age and size. The other interesting question is, well, how many of these are actually operating at any one time? Now, I've just done this for industrial tunnels because it's quite difficult to do for um, research facilities because no one will tell you when they started running and they definitely won't tell you when they stopped running. Universities will quietly close wind tunnels and they will disappear without anyone ever knowing about it. So I've had to leave those out. Um, but what I did was look at transonic tunnels um, and track down when they came online, when they went offline and add them up. Um, and actually this ended up as being really quite surprising. Um, starting with continuous tunnels. This is the world population of operational continuous tunnels. Starting at zero in 1946 um, and kind of stabilizing. So we had a post-war innovation. People were trying everything. ADC, for example, were going through any number of different kinds of wall configurations. A lot of innovation going on there. By the time we got the 60s, the technology had pretty much matured and the numbers have stabilized at around about 20 tunnels from 1960 to 19, 1995. Then mid-90s, we had the, um, the facility cleansing process in the UK. Uh, we had facilities closing here. We had facilities closing in the States. Um, so tough times of continuous tunnels. And then we settled down again into the 2000s and things really haven't changed that much since then. So that's the continuous tunnels. We put intermittent tunnels on top of that, quite a different picture. For a start, they started as significantly later than continuous tunnels. You kind of think blowdowns are easier to do than continuous, but no. They were harder, mid 50s. And actually, the very first Agard, Agardograph report, 1956, I think it was, was on the design and operation of intermittent wind tunnels. So it goes right back to the beginning of Agard. Um, and we get the same kind of things technology stabilizing, a bit of a uh, steadiness. And then 1970s, another growth spurt. And you tended, to, what's happening here, I think, is that you're getting tunnels being built almost off the shelf. You have DSMA, who became ILOS, who designed and built the Canadian uh, Five Foot, are then building, not clones, but tunnels based on that design around the world, um, BTI, T38, uh, one or two others, and also Fluidine um, were involved in building uh, American-style blowdown tunnels in a number of different countries. And the interesting thing there, of those trisonic tunnels that have been built, only one, and that's about, you sit at the end there, about 20 tunnels, in that period, only one of those has ever closed permanently. That's the North American seven foot. Pretty much every other large tri trisonic blowdown tunnel that's ever been built is still running. Then add them together, and you get this um, kind of interesting plot. This is all the transonic industrial tunnels in the world at any one time. And you can see there's our 1995 uh, peak there. But what is interesting is we're getting back up to the levels we had in the mid 90s. Um, as of next year, there will be as many industrial tunnels running now as there ever have been, which I think is quite encouraging and also rather surprising. The two at the end, the second one is um, a tunnel that's under construction at the moment in India for the Indian Space Research Organization uh, at BSSC. Uh, that's, um, that's in construction. I've seen pictures of them moving the settling chamber into position uh, only in the last couple of weeks. That's halfway there. Um, and uh, CAI or Tubizak are planning to start a blowdown project in Turkey following on from that. So we've got a couple of new blowdown tunnels in progress there. But we've also got other, other players coming into the game here at this last 10 or 15 years. China, which I'll come back to, a couple of uh, tunnels there. Korea have reactivated the lovely T1500 from Sweden. That's been shipped over to Korea and be built. That's been running now for two or three years. Um, India have a new project. Uh, and obviously Turkey have got new projects there. 
And this is what I've called the 21st century renaissance. You can see this some tough years there, a, a gradually downward trend, and then sometime in 2010, 2015, it reversed and started climbing back up again. And no apparent reason, really, but it's coming back. There is another interesting um, indicator, which is the membership of the Supersonic Tunnels Association, which is a marvelous organization um, for operators of high speed facilities. And um, if we start off with the number of tunnels we've got there and we stick on top of that, the number of members of STAI, you can see a kind of similar pattern. As people designed and built big high speed tunnels, the membership came up. Um, it's a bit Volatile people come and go, people run out of money or uh, get some money and they can afford to uh, take part. But what you can see is similarly with the tunnels in the mid 90s, the membership dropped right off. You went from having more member organizations than there were transonic wind tunnels to having fewer. And that dropped off fairly steadily. But again, around about 2010, the trend absolutely reversed itself and the numbers are now climbing. And you can see there again, we've gone back up to about 38 members of STAI. So almost the same thing has happened. Somewhere around 10 years ago, people started to take high-speed testing a bit more seriously. They got back into the technology of it. They started getting involved in the organizations internationally that ran these things. Um, in the UK, currently, ARA is the only member of STAI. DERA dropped out in 2001 when we closed our wind tunnels. Um, BAE left in 2010. ARA left about the same time, but is now back in again. And interestingly, no UK university has ever been a member. There are quite a number of American and uh, other universities around the world uh, are actually members of the organization. Like, it doesn't particularly cost anything other than going to meetings, and it's a, uh, it's a very valuable activity there. But it's interesting the way that that membership has paralleled the turnaround in numbers of tunnels. So um, who's doing what? I'm not going to go into detail. This is, this is in the paper I've written there. But essentially, trying to break down these tunnels by country, what you can see is that we've still got more tunnels in the US down here at the bottom than any other country, but up at the top there, China is working hard to catch up. Um, and you can also see some other features there, but if you look at countries that have active, serious military aircraft projects, they tend to have two industrial scale transonic wind tunnels. The only exceptions being India and Turkey. India, though, are working hard. So they've got a project for a two meter supersonic wind tunnel. and um, Turkey are also have tunnel building projects going on there. You've also got in those countries a supporting ecosystem of research facilities and research organizations and supersonic tunnels, with the exceptions again of Turkey, also South Korea, and rather concerning the UK. This is what the UK is missing here. We don't have that ecosystem of the, uh, the supporting research and, and, and facilities. Also, if you look at these countries that are running transonic wind tunnels, almost all of them have a national aerospace research organization that either operates these facilities or supports them being operated. And again, the exceptions are Israel, because you have IAI, which is an aircraft company which operates their wind tunnels. You could argue whether that's a government or a commercial organization. But the other glaring exception is the UK. We do not have a national aerospace research organization that is involved with high-speed wind tunnel testing in this way. The SCL, ATI, EPSERC have not stepped up to fill the gap that was left by the REE and DERA when they were when they uh, stepped out of the wind tunnel, the high speed wind tunnel game. So kind of what's been happening with these uh, these kind of uh, sort of renaissance going on there. Well, it's interesting. I'm going to talk first about China because China is the, is the obvious outlier here. So going through what they built, just to give you an idea of what's coming up in, uh, in China. 1999, it's not quite the 21st century, but it's just about scraping in there. FL26, a 2.4 meter. Um, this actually is the scaled up version of T1500. And I believe the Swedes actually helped them design and build this tunnel. So it's a, yeah, it's a close circuit intermission facility. 2.4 meter, 1.4 in 1999. FL3, another blowdown, 1.5 meter, Mach 2.2 .2 in 2002. The dates are a bit approximate for Chinese tunnels. It's often quite difficult to work at exactly when they came online. Stuff appears and disappears off their websites, for example. Um, thank goodness for the Internet Archive for tracking back on what's been going on there. Um, come on, there we go. This is an interesting one. Northwestern Polytechnic University, NF6, a continuous 0.6 at 1.2. This is the first, this is their first continuous transonic wind tunnel. They didn't even build a continuous transonic wind tunnel until 2003. Then we've got FD12, another trisonic tunnel, 1.2 meter. 
We've got um, a, a pilot tunnel at CRDC, a 0.6 meter transonic tunnel. We've got uh, another blowdown at FL60, NAVIC, in 2016, the Mac 4 tunnel. We've got um, a 0.6 meter um, continuous on, which is a pilot facility, FL61. We have another blowdown in 2018, FL32. Um, and then finally, we have FL62, which came online in the last year or so. This is an ARA class continuous running 2.4 meter test section, 1 point, Mac 1.5 uh, tunnel there. So in the last 20 years, the Chinese have built five industrial scale transonic wind tunnels and another four mid-range research tunnels. It's interesting, people at the minute are getting a bit twitchy about, oh, they've suddenly come out of the, the, the woods on hypersonics and everyone's getting worried about how are they getting on so well. This is the reason why the Chinese have been putting the groundwork in for 20 years now on high-speed aerodynamics. They've been, I've not even talked about hypersonics, but they've been building tunnels and they've been building, they've also been working hard on instrumentation and on the test techniques for 20 years. It's really not surprising. They've kind of caught up with the rest of the world because they have put the effort in. So that's China. The rest of the world looks a bit like this. So 2000 Australian DST, supposedly an upgrade to an existing tunnel, but actually it's a completely new facility. That's a nice tunnel. Um, we're big. A uh, pilot tunnel in Brazil. This was a pilot for a big national project that was cancelled. It was only a 0.3 metre facility. Um, Trisonic gas dynamics facility in the States was reactivated after having mothballed um, for 10, 15 years. Um, in Singapore, the SWIFT facility is a, an American, uh, I think this was ex Lockheed. It's quite difficult to track down some of these tunnels. That was relocated to Singapore around about 2005 um, and is running there. We have uh, another university tunnel, another small one in Mississippi. We have a 0.6 meter continuous uh, tunnel in Iran. Came online in 2009. They're quite open about this, they're publishing papers on it. I think this one is actually run, it's, it's, it's very old school. It's run with a number of jet engines sucking air through it. A bit like we used to have in this country, a number of tunnels like that a number of years ago. Um, new polysonic tunnel at uh, Florida State. Um, another polysonic trisonic tunnel at uh, Institute Saint Louis in, um, in France. So you notice most of these are quite small. There's a lot of 0.3 meter kind of research facilities. Um, it's not really new, but this is um, T1500 relocated to Korea from Sweden. Um, we've got another research facility at Arizona, which is in the progress of, of, of coming back online. That's a modified supersonic tunnel. Uh, and then we've got ISRO's trisonic tunnel. I'll be cut us about the best picture I can find of the building site at the moment. Um, the, any other, all the other pictures are basically bits of it was tarpaulins over. Um, so we've got three industrial tunnels in the whole of the world in the last 20 years, uh, and a handful of um, kind of mid, three mid-range research tunnels. However, there are a lot of upgrades going on. A lot of people are actually modifying and, and improving the tunnels they've got. And a good example of minute is DNW's HST, which is in the middle of a massive upgrade. Uh, new test section, that's a big step. So they've, they've got a slotted wall test section, they've now got a perforated wall test section. That's phase one, they're on to phase two. And this is building on a refurb they did 10, 15 years ago. So they're, they're putting a lot of money into that tunnel. So just to fill in the gaps, just the end, I've talked about transonic tunnels, but just so I haven't forgotten supersonics, there is a big supersonic tunnel in, in China as well. This is FL28, uh, Mach 4, two meter continu uh, continuous supersonic tunnel. And we've got a couple of small ones. This is uh, VKFD. Uh, in the States, reactivated. Just to notice that the Americans are reactivating facilities. Um, they didn't, you know, they did demolish quite a lot, but quite a number were mothballed, uh, put to one side and kept in a reasonable condition. So we had um, uh, the um, TGF coming on, we've now got VKFD. Um, that's a uh, supersonic tunnel in the Netherlands, which was mothballed and then reactivated. And this is a classic 16S, as uh, is now running again. 16 foot supersonic wind tunnel. Max 3.4, that's a serious, serious facility. And they're talking about pushing it back up to higher speeds. Uh, that was mothballed at the turn of the century and it's now being reactivated. So three industrial supersonic tunnels there. And in terms of what people are doing with those, what's supporting that? I'll give a couple of examples. I'll talk about the States because 
to be honest, the Americans are much more open about what they do with their tunnels. They publish a lot of stuff. They publish their reviews. Uh, they publish the results of the reviews. They write some very honest papers about, uh, about what they're doing with their tunnels. Um, and what you saw in the States was, as here, end of the 20th century, a lot of tunnels being closed, a lot of tunnels being demolished. Endless capability reviews over that period. NASA reviews and national facility studies, RANS did one, um, there was an NSTC plan, there was another RAND study. Um, but I think in a way, they do so many studies because somebody somewhere thinks these are important enough to argue a lot about who's going to pay for them and how many they need centrally at a fairly senior government level. Lots of grand initiatives. Um, now, every now and then I forget what half of this uh, half of these means, but we've got National Wind Tunnel Alliance, we've got a National Alliance for, for, aeronautics, for testing in aeronautics, we've got a National Partnership for Aeronautical Testing, um, sorry, National Programme, we've got an Aeronautical Testing Partnership, and we have the Aeronautical Evaluation and Test Capability, AETC. So over the last <coughs> few decades, we've also had, as well as the closures and reviews, there have been a number of programmes within NASA and the American establishment to um, support these facilities with varying degrees of success. But the last one, AETC, has just cracked in there and done some really good things. Um, this is our aeroscience capability. New funding model has come in. About 2017, there was a national recognition that these facilities were strategic. That you couldn't look at them as purely as commercial facilities. They needed to be funded. They needed to, be ma they needed to maintain core capabilities. And what you suddenly got was about 2016, these facilities were funded at 50% of their fixed costs. 2017, that shifted to 100% of fixed costs. 2019, it moved on to 100% plus consumables for NASA customers. So if you're a NASA customer in the States, you basically pay your own costs. The tunnels are fully funded or almost fully funded, which has kind of crept in. There's, it's not a secret. It's in various presentations, but there's not a lot of fuss made about it. But what it is leading to is it's leading into investment in operations, how you run these tunnels, maintenance, they're catching up on maintenance that has been put off for years. They're enhancing capability and they're developing test technologies. A lot of activity within this program because they've now got the steady funding. And of course, utilization rates have gone up. This is almost the opposite of what happened in the UK back in the, in the 1990s. Yes, I can, see a, I can see a groan there. This is exactly the opposite. You fund them and people use them again. And I'll just example this covers. The unitary, unitary plan wind tunnel at Ames, it covers NASA Glen 8 by 6, it covers the transonic dynamics tunnel at Langley, and it covers the, trans, the national transonic facility, the big cryogenic tunnel, and a bunch of other facilities. These are just the transonic ones. Um, on the commercial side, the uh, ARA's competitor over the States, CalSpan, has also been working hard on, their, on investing in the last few years. So the Calspan Tunnel, it's the only other commercial facility in the world, apart from ARA here in Bedford, been through a number of owners. But in the last 10 years or so, they've started picking up capabilities, picking up other companies, acquired Triumph Aerospace. In particular, this is a company that designs some excellent wind tunnel balances. They've gone through a fairly massive upgrade of their data reduction systems. They've replaced all of their legacy Fortran codes with them, um, with Python. Now, much as I can't stand Python, that's a really big, big improvement. Um, they've uh, got their own company funded uh, investment in lots of bits and pieces within the facility. They bought Fluidine, well, it's now ASE, so they bought a transonic, hypersonic and propulsion test capability. And most recently they bought Accent Laboratories. So they're expanding their capability to cover everything from low speed to hypersonic. Um, so that's the kind of activities you've seen in commercial and the government side in the state. Um, and just a quick examples of the sort of things that people are now doing with these improved tunnels. Some examples of the capabilities, integrating EFD and CFD. I've been doing it a long time, actually. This is 2013. This is JAXA's, JAXA's um, Darwin hybrid wind tunnel. Um, moving a lot more into um, kind of optical methods for off-surface flows. I put background oriented clear and PIV in there. Always a bit tricky in them um, transonic wind tunnels because you've got Kind of slotted and perforated walls so and getting getting optical access is tricky but they, those are becoming uh game changers the real game changer i think for transonic testing is pressure sensitive paint both uh, static and dynamic pressure sensitive paint this is a brilliant technology um we're also seeing a, a lot more off-the-shelf instrumentation 
uh, pressure scanners are getting better and better. You can now buy probes that 20, 30 years ago you'd have made in-house. And there's a number of companies making very good uh, probe systems there. So the instrumentation has improved. Air elastic models are coming on. Model deformation measurement with optical methods, real-time model deformation tracking for not only air elastic testing, but also for flexible aircraft models. Um, so there's a lot of applications there. Propulsion integration testing, because modern propulsion systems are so much more integrated, you, you, you have to move away from testing a pod on its own, isolated propulsion systems. You've got to do the whole thing together. Um, control and data acquisition systems. We're piggybacking on, on the amazing advances in, in, in computers and uh, uh, electronic systems over the last 20, 30 years. And other neat one is additive manufacture starting to appear. It's been used in low speed testing, but um, we're now seeing it appear for serious balances and serious models that are taking big loads. Um, NASA Langley has, um, for example, um, been uh, using additive manufacture for load bearing components for uh, models tested in the, uh, the trans in their cryogenic tunnel. So serious load bearing components. People are also starting to look at additive manufacturing balances. So that's a, a, an, on, a, a, an up and coming technology. Okay, that's the world. Let's come and look at the UK. Um, since we're in the UK. Uh, so there's my plot of the tunnels of the world. Lots and lots of them. The UK ones are stuck in here, so let's pull them out. There we go. That's what we've got here in the UK. Flip back. There we go. So some of the things that jump out at you, one is we've got very no very large wind tunnels, but then nobody else has other than the French and the Americans. There are no government, no government facilities in the UK. There are no research tunnels of a significant size. Nine inches as big as a university research facility gets in this country. We had others, but MPL and REE and at the aircraft companies, they've all gone. All the tunnels we have running in the UK are first generation. They're original, original designs, almost, almost unmodified. Same test section configuration at ARA and at BAE as it was when the tunnels were built. The newest wind tunnel, newest transnet tunnel operating in the UK is 55 years old. We had a newer one at Cranfield, but it blew up and they closed it. <laughs> well, I think, I think the drive blew up. That was just, yeah, a bit mean. Um, so I'll just zoom in on that. We'll get rid of the big, the, the empty part of the screen. Um, so what have we got? We've got two transonic industrial scale tunnels. ARA's uh, tunnel here and BAE's blowdown uh, HSWT up at Wharton. Also, these are the only large supersonic test capabilities left in the UK. There are no supersonic wind tunnels of any significant size other than these two running in the UK. There are no solid wall tunnels left. There is one, there is a 30 inch ARA, but it's not usable anymore. All of our research tunnels have gone. These are the kind of the jewels in the crown, the way everyone's here, the eight by six at Farnborough, the three foot at Bedford, the REE here, um, and um, a bunch of smaller tunnels at the REE, at the National Physical Laboratory, and also in the aircraft companies. They're all gone. We have no specialized 2D capability. We have no tunnels that are designed for testing Air Force sections. Um, there is the ARA 2D, but that's no longer operational. What we have left are six university research facilities in the four inch to nine inch range. Um, the six of those, the ones in blue are still running, the ones in red are, um, are now gone. The, one, the two that are boxed are part of the National Wind Tunnel Facility, which is an EPSERC funded group. Well, it was EPSERC funded, they're not funded at the moment. Um, these are small and they're essentially kind of one to tunnels. They're not, they don't have a, a configuration aerodynamics capability of any significance. They're just too small and they're too underpowered. Just to show you what we have got, I will run through these quickly because most people are familiar with it. The two industrial tunnels, this is the ARA facility um, up the road there, continuous Mac uh, 1.4, pressurized, but ju only just runs on 30 megawatts, so about half the power of the local town of Bedford. Um, and that's not a big tunnel by transonic tunnel standards. We've also got BAE's high-speed uh, wind tunnel up at Wharton. So this is a, a blowdown facility, four-foot test section, Mach 3.9, higher pre naught there, very similar test section configuration. 
At universities, the other end of the scale, there's nothing in between. We have a number of small tunnels. They've all got uh, ventilated walls, four inch to nine inch, all intermittent operation. Typically, they tend to be run either subsonically or supersonically. They don't often use these tunnels in the true transonic regime, often because they just don't have the pressure ratio capability to put any kind of serious blockage in there. They do, one exception is, for example, Cambridge using their tunnel as a, as a cascade tunnel. So you look at internal transonic flows, but you're not putting a model into the flow, you're using the tunnel as a duct to represent an intake in itself there. So the cascade tunnels, or the supersonic or the subsonic, very rarely operated at 0 0.8, 0 0.85, they're not getting there. What we do have is we have a little tunnel at Queen Mary, that's 0.85, so it barely counts, but it's a nice little facility. We have the Cambridge SST, 0.14, the 1962 tunnel. Uh, it's got, it's a bit annoying whether it's two tunnels or two test sections on the same drive, but uh, that's currently running as a cascade facility for an intake. Uh, Manchester have a trisonic tunnel. Um, well, they call it trisonic, but it doesn't actually go that fast anymore. That's war booty. That's an, that, most of that came from, I think it might have come from Guttingen. Um, we have the Z4 up at ARA, which was a little perforated nine-inch tunnel built in the 60s. In fact, there were three of these tunnels built in the UK at around the same time. Trivenham, the Royal, used to be the Royal Military College of Science. It's now part of Cranfield University. Have uh, a very similar wind tunnel. There was another one at City University, which has now been closed. Um, City have their second transonic tunnel, which is now the only one they've got. This is kind of the biggest and best transonic research facility left in the UK. Nine inch. Uh, Mac 2. And there is a mysterious tunnel. Up at Glasgow, if you look at Glasgow website, there is a trisonic tunnel described on the website. 0.18 meter test section, Mac 3. But this tunnel doesn't actually seem to be running. I'm not convinced it's ever even been assembled, but it is on the website. So it's kind of a bit of a ghost facility. Uh, I'm not sure whether it exists. I've asked for information, been directed to the website. There's a picture of a bit of it, um, but there's no work that I've seen come out of this facility. So um, just to note there, the two in blue there, they are normally members of the National Wind Tunnel Facility. So these, those two tunnels do have some direct support, or they did until their, the NWTF finished its funding round um, two years ago, I think. So where are we going with that then? Where is the investment in the UK into, into wind tunnels? Well, the research facilities, there's a little bit of money coming in from NWTF, which has been focused on instrumentation, essentially LDA, PIV, hot wire systems for those two tunnels. There are bits and pieces coming from various EPSA projects, industrial projects, but there's nothing central uh, supporting those facilities. BAE have had some, some com company funded work. They've um, refurbished their nozzle, their test section, their model cart, although they did have to. We'd have to contract that out. ARA, they get controversial there. A bit of company funded work. Around the turn of the century, the, the, the main, the, uh, the kind of auxiliary clean and exhaust suction compressor was replaced because the original 1950s compressor failed. Um, this was partially commissioned, um, but some of the things that run off that compressor, including, for example, the 30 inch supersonic tunnel uh, and the max simulation tank, uh, were disconnected at that point. It was never fully um, recommissioned. There was a, a grand plan to upgrade the tunnel test envelope from Mac 1.4 to 1.7, which involved buying a new motor, a new, um, a new, comp a new uh, transformer, but this was then cancelled. I think somebody, someone said, well, we don't really need 1.7, so they stopped. Uh, and those bits and pieces, the transformer um, sat outside for, um, for the next uh, 15 years. Um, ARA has also had a fair amount of money from ATI well, it started off as the UK Aerodynamics Centre, which then became the Aerospace Technology Institute, lost the aerodynamics bit on the way through there. That actually came to about 15 and a half million over uh, a number of years there, about 10 million for specific test capabilities and about 5 million for plant and equipment. I think that was the issue. This was aimed at several headline projects with very short timescales. Some of it worked and unfortunately some of it didn't, but you wouldn't know that from what you'd see on ATI and the UKRI websites. The write-ups on these are all fairly anodyne, but there were some successes, some things are still ongoing, 
there were also a number of a number of technical and or commercial failures there, which is a pity, um, partly because these were bitty projects. They weren't integrated. There was a, a bid from ARA into ATI to try and do a more integrated fundamental refurbishment upgrade um, of the tunnel that was rejected back in 2017. I think that's as far as it's gone. So that's kind of where we are in the UK. I'm going to finish off then with uh, some, um, some final remarks. First of all, in the UK situation, as far as I can see, there is still a need for UK transonic test capability. The rest of the world is, is charging ahead with building new facilities, enhancing the ones they've got, making good use of them. They're all busy. If you look at the sort of things that are happening in the UK, we've got Tempest, we've got Lanco, they've got um, Loyal Wingman, we have Eralis, um, Crane, which is a kind of um, project for DARPA, which is going to be some kind of transonic airframe. Obviously, ATI would fly zero. We have um, very highly integrated transonic cruising airliners. We have missiles at MBDA. So we've got uh, Spear and we've got the new um, anti-ship weapon cruise missile there. Also, all sorts of interesting Airbus projects. For example, I think it's Albatross. It's called this um, flexible with the, the folding wingtip. It's great at model scale, but at some point that's got to be done transonically. That's got to work at cruise conditions, which is not low speed. You need a transonic facility and you need a big size tunnel to do that. You can't do that in a little nine inch tunnel. That, is, that requires a serious capability. And at the same time, we're still not at the point where you can do this with CFB. You can help out a lot, but in particular, it's not there for edge of the envelope work for unconventional configurations. For the next decade or even two decades, you're still going to need the analog part of digital twinning, as well as the, the, the digital CFB side of it or whatever the modeling. So kind of what's going wrong, uh, to be a little bit controversial. Completely, just, there isn't a national kind of overarching vision for aerospace ground test capabilities. I'm expanding past wind tunnels into everything you need to test aerospace vehicles or systems on the ground before you fly them. The planning organizations, the funding organizations are fragmented. There's lots of them, none of them talk to each other. The technical needs for all of these areas tend to get lost in the politics within those organizations. They tend to work on short term horizons. And this has been a, 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 a long running issue with UK government uh, support for all sorts of science and technology. People like to see one off set piece headline projects. We want, some, we want some nice pictures and we want them in a year's time so we can, we can get, show them to our minister. So you tend to get, you still, after all these decades, we're still looking at one year at a time funding horizons and a focus from the top level on things like spend profiles and milestones rather than your technical achievements. And it's a bit unfair perhaps to say it's a blame culture, but you're in a situation with a lot of organisations where you can't admit that you're failing because you won't get any more money from them. And to be honest, if you can't admit you're failing, or things are going wrong, then you'll never learn from your mistakes. And other people will never learn from your mistakes. You'll carry on and carry on until everything collapses completely, rather than stopping early on and saying, yeah, actually, this is the wrong thing, or this isn't working properly. We need to rethink it. And that culture of not being able to admit to a funding body that it's going wrong, because things do go wrong. It's engineering. It's the real world. Uh, you kind of beat the laws of physics. You can try, but sometimes they will bite you. Uh, as also with the law of economics. And finally, is that there is, we don't, there is an inadequate supporting ecosystem, ecosystem for these activities to operate within. We don't have a national research organization sitting underneath like REE and DERI used to do, supporting, and like NASA does in the States and every other country that operates um, high-speed facilities. We lost REE and DERA. What we have, ATI, EPSERC, DSTL, MOD Kinetic, none of those have actually been able to fill that gap in terms of supporting um, these, these activities. And we also, there is actually no, there are no mid-range facilities at all in the UK. You can see the Chinese, as well as building big, expensive wind tunnels, have built four or five 0.6 metre significantly sized research facilities to support that activity. What we've got is a handful of very small tunnels with to be honest, very limited test envelopes. So how are we going to get out of that? Good question, and I'm really not entirely sure. Um, 
beyond my pay grade, but here are some suggestions. Learn from the rest of the world, because things are going right in the rest of the world at the moment. And what you can see, a lot of these, is that people have national strategies. At a top level, they have, a grip, they have decided that aeronautical, aerospace ground test facilities are strategic, and they need supporting, and they need funding for both civil and military aircraft projects. A, the, a, the, the NASA AETC portfolio is an excellent example of this. But you've still also got the same thing going on with Honor, DNW, these organizations that are keeping their facilities running. You need to have a much longer, I think, a longer term view on program management and facility management. I put science focused. I almost started with engineer led, but um, thinking about the outcomes, not about the project management parts of it. And a really good example here is if you get this paper from ADC, AIAA 2018 2923. A remarkably honest paper from AADC about how things went really badly wrong for them in about 2008. And they had to step back and completely rethink how they did things. It took them 10 years to go from what you read in that paper, pretty much some very some disastrous um, programs and some real problems with technical uh, rigor. And it's taken them five to 10 years to, to really get back on top of that. Uh, and it's a great paper, and I say it's, a, it's an amazingly honest paper about how they admit it. We got it wrong. We tried to be the Walmart of wind tunnels. We tried to be rent arranged, and it didn't work. It just went wrong. Um, and we've now gone back to the test engineers on site, for example, being part of the development programs. But it's, it's a, it's a, there's a lot in there, so have a look at that. Um, but what we pulled together there is those two things together in the UK being we need to look at ARA. We need to look because it's all it's the best we've got. We're not going to build a new transonic wind tunnel of that size in the UK. Very few people are doing that. But we've got a good tunnel. It needs a lot of time and money and efforts work spend on it. So that's what we need to look at within these two areas. Further on down, we really should be looking at re-establishing that national aerodynamics and aerospace research ecosystem. Uh, I mentioned there China's investment in these 0.6 meter tunnels is a really good example. Controversial there, take aerodynamics research funding away from EPSWORK and ATI. They're not doing a good job with it. In particular, they're not supporting military applications. And a lot of work in the UK is military. Best one in the world, EPSWERC don't want to, be, don't want to touch it. ATI don't want to touch it. You end up with a, a black hole in terms of supporting military activities. And that is a big part, both of our UK defense capability and also our um, kind of sales capability. Unfortunately, there's no UK universities got the, the, the infrastructure support, even a 0.6 meter wind tunnel. They don't have the power supplies, they don't have the workshops, they don't have the space. Most universities, you're amazed how you, you go to Imperial and they're squeezing wind tunnels into, into, into corners. It's, uh, um, I mean, they're doing the best, but it's not, it's not a great place to try and build a new wind tunnel. And to be honest, we, I, to my point of view, I think we should be going back to the original concept that we had for the UK Aerodynamics Centre and also for the National Wind Tunnel Facility of not being a virtual facility, but actually in real facilities. At least, in other words, recreating something at NPL scale rather than REE. We're not going to get back to REE, but we could get back to NPL, where we had those mid-range research facilities supporting the activities of UK industry. I mentioned there, of course, ARA, Bedford. Naturally, being a Bedford uh, person, that would be a great place to do it because you've got Infrastructure, you've got room to expand, and you've got the whole Oxford Cambridge arc thing going on there as well. So, finally, just to, to sum up on a more positive note, because things are actually overall, from a global point of view, this is a really, really good time to be a high speed test engineer. Brilliant. Most, almost all high speed wind tunnels are busy, they're full. You can't get into them, some of them, for years. That's transonic, supersonic, and hypersonics. Lots of activity, lots of demand for test engineers. Despite the hype, CFD still hasn't really had a major impact on the requirements for those tunnels. I know that's a bit controversial, and I'm not putting down CFD. It's a very important part of it, but it hasn't replaced the tunnel, and it's not going to replace the tunnel for, I don't know, I would say 10 years, because 10 years is the, is the, is the standard horizon. It's at least 10 years away. Um, what has changed, you know, the, the actual what we're doing in transonic wind tunnels is quite odd. You could, you could bring someone from the, the 60s, the 50s and 60s, you could resurrect Ron Hills and put him up at ARA, and he'd recognise most of what was going on there. It's just, the, the interpretation's got better, 
the time pressures have got higher, the, the tests have got more complex, but the fundamental things are almost the same. And to me, point of view, it is, they got more complex, so to me, they got more interesting, which is another reason why it's a really good time to be a test engineer. Well, globally, as I said, we're getting a bit of a renaissance going on. People are building or new tunnels or reactivating old tunnels or moving old tunnels all over the world, but particularly China, Korea, India, and Turkey. The numbers of tunnels are going back up again. And at the minute, I don't know what's going to happen after the, um, the Turkish project, but there are at least two two-meter transonic continuous running tunnel projects in hand, and, and, and others pop up every now and then. We've got this decent floating population globally of about 60 or 70 smaller research facilities. And that's the nice thing is that of these tunnels, particularly, you want to go and work in a tunnel, work in a blowdown, because nobody closes blowdown tunnels. It's really weird, but they've all survived. Even the, even the seven foot, the North American seven foot, was actually given to a university. And it took another couple of decades before the university finally ran out of money and patience and shut it. Investment levels globally are rising, the Americans, the Chinese, um, DMW, people are enhancing capabilities globally. If you look at industrial facilities around the world, almost every single one has had major refurbishments, major upgrades in the last 10, 20 years. And at the same time, new instrumentation, DPSP, um, MDM, background organization, all of these things are having a major impact on data productivity and also data quality. We're getting better and better data out of these facilities um, than we ever did. So that's like my, my positive ending. It's actually a really good time in most of the world. So there we go. I'll finish off. That's if anyone knows wants to know what that is. Um, some of you will know. Any guesses? Are we doing any stuffy little questions? Oh, oh good. Uh oh. Um, I will say that what I can't answer here, I'll um, I'll get back to people as well. So I'm hoping to start a discussion with some of these things. Oh. So if any of the audience has any questions, like, uh, no, yeah, no. go on then. If you do get it, you're going to just mind it. Okay, then. Yeah. Joe, Joe, I'm like, this is 30 years ago, I was on one of the eight or six planes, 20 years ago, one of the eight or six planes, and it was extensive in the back. And the background of the, the long rear guard action was the Essentially, for the programs, if there weren't programs to support mm. MOD, MOD weren't prepared to fund facilities which there were not active programs that needed them. Um, I in 94 they decided that we weren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they didn't publicize it, but it was that's what it was. MOD had a change of policy around about 2004 when they realized that actually there was a national export. And um, Tyrannus came out of the blue, uh, actually came out of the black. But the fact that we did resurrect a national capability in the face of what was pretty much a star managerial attitude from mm -hmm. down. Unless we have programs to sustain these things, we're still going to get somewhere on the line from a funding body with them saying, why is this mm -hmm. what is this getting us now? Yeah. What, what, what is this going to give us? Uh, yeah. So I think that's that. So Steve's it's quite a long question there, but the main thing there is that if you don't have um, programs running at that moment in time that need a facility, why should MOD or the UK government support those facilities? And I think that is, but at the same time, people have resurrected capabilities. I think you get a combination there. You get the bottom up approach from the people that are at the coal face will have to actually make things work, like Taranis, um, who have faced, who have to work around the difficulties that are put in their way, um, and often do have to do things in a very um, inefficient way. But the the top level thing is is getting away from this short term. If we haven't got a project, a program right now that needs a transonic tunnel, we don't need a transonic tunnel because I think it's part of this attitude that you can you can put these things away. And then ten years later, when you need them, you can pull them out of a out of a box, and that is 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 a, is completely wrong. I mean, just doesn't work. That's what yeah. killed the airport. Yeah, it's what killed the airport, and I think it almost we haven't mentioned yeah. the airport because it's not yeah. solid force. 
Oh, well, again, it's just no longer with us to tell us how it's going to fix it. Um, but I think that, that was part of the overall picture. Yeah. You know, in terms of what do the UK, what the UK going to do in terms mm -hmm. of overall capability for vehicles that we're going to operate in the yeah. transonic supersonic regime? And at that point, they didn't see that there was a need. Yeah, I think that's the interesting contrast with, we obviously had the same kind of activity in, in the States. We had a number of um, reviews which recommended closing tunnels, and quite a lot did close. Um, some didn't quite, for example, the, the Transatlantic Tunnel at Langley was slated for closure for a long time, but it seems to have survived because at some point you move away from that um, kind of, uh, commercial. It's it has to make money. It has to have work in that is make that is revenue earning. That you you think only about wind tunnels as um, uh, a revenue earning facility at that point in time, whereas you have to step back and do as other countries have done and look at it from a strategic point of view. And yes, we don't need it perhaps, well, 10 years ago, you could say we didn't need these tunnels at that moment. But when you come to the point where you do need them and you haven't got them, you are absolutely stuck because it's really difficult. And part of me is thinking it may almost be too late to resurrect some of those capabilities. It's nice to see the DNW tunnels. Yeah. Yes, to see the HSD. If I tested them, we would be trying to do Yes, yeah. Thank you. So, so there's, there's, it's great to see new tunnels being, yes. being made and, and commissioned. Uh, and you also touched on some of the fantastic improved capabilities that, that we yeah. uh, and love. So, you know, PSP and mm -hmm. DPSP as well. The interesting thing, though, to me was that the, a lot of those new tunnels were commissioned uh, or certain plans or the new capabilities mm -hmm. yeah. that came on stream. So, so that the, it wasn't because of oh, these new capabilities, we must have a no, new tunnel no. to exploit them. They, they came after it. You've you got any thoughts as to why, why they got commissioned the way they did? Um, it's just, I've, it is a little puzzling because from the outside, you take the kind of, oh, well, there aren't programs, so why would they need them? But clearly, somebody somewhere in a number of different countries started to take a longer term view. But the things like capabilities, because you can obsess about a particular test technique, but really, that things come and go. Test techniques, DPSP, you can't, you can, you, you, other than thinking, well, we're going to need optical methods, so we need optical access. That's about as far as you need to go in the tunnel design. Um, but the fundamental thing is you need to have something to blow air. That's, you can't do anything else if you don't have that. But the, almost in a way, with a lot of the test techniques, you're at a point where you can piggyback. A lot of these things come along for free now, but perhaps this wasn't the way 20 years ago, where if you wanted a PSP system, you'd have to do like, and you have to spend 10 years developing it yourself. Now, you want a decent camera for your high-speed PIV, you wait six months and someone puts one out on the market for you. So the capabilities almost, that's become, an active in its own right, but you have this fundamental thing sitting underneath it all of a, I think this thing was very difficult to get across to people was that it was the, it was simple stuff. It wasn't, they were coming along and getting cheap all the time. The things that really cost you was facility running in the first place and paying for things like refurbishments for cleaning, for calibrations. I mean, one thing that people, when, when the ATC thing came out, and I talked to Ron Quintana and a couple of other people, and they were over the moon because they could calibrate their tunnels again. They'd had a, a many years when they couldn't afford to refurbish them, to, to that to skimp on maintenance. They were skimping on calibration. And to a scientist, a tunnel is a, is a measurement system. The whole thing is a system. And what tends to happen is people focus on the, little, on the sexy bits at the top. But really, it's the whole thing that you need to keep there. And if you lose that whole system, if you if your tunnel becomes so, if, you know, if your drive gear becomes so decrepit, you can't guarantee it's going to keep running every day. Um, you know, if you haven't calibrated it, so you're not entirely sure what the flow quality is since it's 20 years since it was last measured. These things, they don't have a headline cost. Uh, you know, a, a, a government minister can come in and look at the wind tunnel and go, that looks very nice. But a scientist comes in, somebody who wants the data from it. I think that's part of the problem with a lot of um, government funding is the people funding the work don't care fundamentally they're not the customers. They don't, you know, whether it works or not isn't really the problem for them. This is where you need, I think this is what was the great thing about things like the national research organizations is they had an ethos of national service underneath at the bottom. 
you worked at RE, you didn't get paid that much, but you knew you were doing something that was important. Um, and you had, a, you had a motive for doing things properly because you knew that at some point, some poor service man was going to sit in an aircraft that sat on top of your science. And I've been in the Air Force as well for a short period, so I kind of appreciated it. You wanted to have the best kit possible and your backside when people were shooting at you. Um, and I think that's what you lost when you lost when you lost Dera. Um, and it, what is interesting to see in other words, people are recreating that from above. They're, they're saying these things are important for the country, that we need to have them. That's almost the attitude there. You, if you think if you if you do it on the basis of well, how much money are we going to make from it? Will it will it bring in a revenue? Nobody, nobody would build any of those tunnels. Nobody would build a new blowdown tunnel because you, 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 you drop 100 million pounds without even thinking about it. You're never going to see that back in the next 20, 30 years, just on commercial activities in that tunnel. You build them because you need them, not because you're going to make money running them. Well, I've got uh, two quick questions, then we'll bring in yeah. questions from the chat. Um, one question on the series. So one is, um, I think at the start, we put up a graph that showed the kind of massive acceleration up the post World War II we go, that we yeah. sort of stabilised for yeah. 30 years or something like that. Yeah. Do you think it will remain, like we may be building some, but I can imagine some they go out of service. Do you think that will remain probably the same for the next well, three years? And, so the other question yeah. is, you mentioned you, someone blew up a wind tunnel or something. Well, I think actually it was, it, was, it, was, it was, I think in that case, it was the dry system that, um, that disassembled itself. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, but wind tunnels do have catastrophic accidents all the time. This is one of the great things about things like STAI, um, is, is that people are honest about their mistakes, they're honest about their failures. They will come along and say, you know, we didn't clear a bolt out of the test section and we trashed every single blade. Um, and I think NASA have got, at the minute, I think it might be the 120 foot tunnel, they're, they're working through replacing blades on that. Happens on a regular basis. But people share these experiences. They, they, things go wrong. You do blow up wind tunnels. You do smash windows. You do, you do get people half sucked into small research tunnels um, because the, the glass is broken. Uh, you know, these things happen, but you share those experiences. You don't hide them and pretend, well, everything's wonderful here. Yeah. I, mean, I remember as a postcard, the first time I went into somebody else's wind tunnel, and you thought, oh, this is as nappy as my tunnel. I feel much better now. Right. It's got all the same holes drilled in the wall and bits of duct tape over the, over the screw heads. And it's a low speed. And you, know, you, you share these things. So, yeah, these are right. In terms of the usage, that's a very good question because you can do plots like that. And it, it, I'll admit, it is a log scale. But, yeah. um, but you know, the trend at the minute, the only thing that was coming down was off that trend was a project. Now, people will predict to you, yes, we're only going to need 10,000 hours or 1,000 hours in the wind tunnel. And, you know, maybe that's true with CFD, but in the back of my head is, is, is on saying, yeah, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it, because I've heard this before. And it, and it probably will. Well, aircraft are going more complex, so I don't know whether it will actually ever come down. It'll, I think it will bobble along in that region for at least another 10. And clearly people are betting. Nobody reactivates 16S without betting that you're going to need that facility for another 10 years. Um, there's a few questions on the chat. I can read them out yeah. to you if you'd like. Um, so the first question came in is, has the change in technical management to commercial management been attractive and surprising to the Absolutely. Yes. No, 100%. <laughs> no, I would have no argument with that at all. Uh, great. Let's go. What changed in the US to change the NASA funding? I'd love to know. Yeah. I'd love to know because well, I think what is interesting is the, is the Americans spend a lot of time reviewing their wind tunnel capability every five to ten years. They have another big review. Sometimes they decide to close them, sometimes they don't, but they care. Somebody cares enough to actually decide whether to close them or not. And so it's a really good question, and I wish I knew, and I wish we could get some of that here. Uh, there's a few. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned an old-fashioned uh, tunnel with jet engines. Jet, jet, and what's the use? Well, you just use a compressor. So it's kind of yeah. <laughs> The thing about those tunnels was people tended, well, we had a few spare jet engines. Um, air, airframers tended to do this. There's a piece, I think it might be the Armstrong with the tunnel. No, not that one. There's, there's one company, and they have three ghosts um, hooked up to it, um, running it basically as an ejector system. Ghost engines. Yeah, ghost engines. The, the old, uh, the old uh, yes, three ghosts. That'd be a good way. It's a sort of Pac Man wind tunnel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, yeah. Yeah. Uh, more of a speculation and question, but I wonder with more environment, would it be? More useful mm -hmm. to run research on brackets such as those in a limited company with majority shareholders from the 
properties of the charge of the revision the new capital for 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 the new the new capital for the new capital for the new capital for the new capital for the new you can't the alarm bells start going off because as soon as you start thinking about are you making money running it, how are you funding it, um, you start worrying about space charges, you start worrying about how you do it, it becomes a cost center, not not a uh, not a not a um, a rev, not another kind of it's not, yeah. So um, when they do need to be run on a financial basis, but you if you start focusing on on putting together complicated financial arrangements, that always goes wrong. Because people start playing games with it. I and mean, it's a very easy thing for accountants to attack. National interest is a difficult thing to attack. Whether you're making 10% or 5% or you're 10% under your utilization or in income target for that year, the accountants are in on you. Yeah, so I think John uh, oh, being quite the I think it's long gone. Part of yeah, Jim, Jim Kidd built it for a project. That's got to be, well, it was mid 90s. Yeah. I know some of them are not currently running, but maybe mm. some of them are But uh, the other one is, uh, did you know Kelly Johnson, uh, one of his first gigs was uh, he went to Stroud and Wintel signed off his university. So they allowed him to re other people. But that was one of his first gigs. As a part of doing private work on other people, it's a bit of an option. <laughs> but maybe that's yeah. the model for the future, especially after this grand winter. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, but, you know, there is actually quite a lot of commercial activity in low speed facilities. You look at the Imperial and, and the, the tunnels, that, the low speed tunnels that have been supported by the MWTF mm. are actually pretty active. We have a lot of motorsport. Yes, but, yeah. Uh, quite a but motorsport. Has moved on. That was a situation where a lot of universities invested, for example, in their wind tunnels to support motorsport. But then the motorsport people just built their own. And Cranfield still has quite a good link with it. But a lot of the other university motorsport tunnels basically lost their income almost overnight um, because the motorsport people did their own. Uh, but again, ATI does not touch motorsport, does not touch building aerodynamics. There's all these other UK aerodynamics activities that are really important. It's a big motorsport activity. We've got some of the biggest wind engineering companies in the world operating here. There's a tunnel, the Milton Keynes tunnel. So it's, you know, it's, only, it's only 10 miles away, RWDI. Yeah. ATI don't touch that. So it's not just aerospace, it's ground test facilities as a whole. It's international. But they're sailing, sailing aerodynamics, they build a yacht, a lot of yachts in this country. There's all sorts of stuff there. But yeah, CFP yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the real challenge is this CFP is good for the bulk yeah. of this sort of work, especially in the early phase of a project. And in driving reduction in the demand for wind tunnels. However, we still absolutely rely on wind tunnels for validation of CFP analysis. How do we make sure we keep tunnels operational for the for when they are needed yeah. or when they're moving? Uh, do you want to sort of make sure the mic's Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think, again, that is the, the problem that Steve came up with. If there isn't a project right at the moment when you need it, and you're closing because they're not making money. But the money is moving to CFD, but I think it shouldn't be. It's kind of, is it's that, yes, I, I, I don't begrudge, I do begrudge a little bit, but I think we're still in a situation where we have to be looking at complementary activities, CFD, and, and you need to work them together. And what tends to happen at the minute, it tends to be both either or in people's mindsets and also in the order in which they do things. You get a lot of people think, well, we'll do lots of CFD, and then we'll go into the winter. And that's not the right way to do it either way. Is that you should be running those two together. It, it, we shouldn't see them as either or. They're part and parcel of the same thing. And that can be done, and it has been done for, for decades in many places. But I, I have a, one of my theories is you get this thing about people say, oh, wind tunnels are dying, CFD is the way forward. Because at universities, most of what you see is CFD. Because let's be honest, at teaching in a university, CFD is cheap. You can buy lots of computers, no one worries. It's easy to get money to buy computers. So you've got lots of CFD platforms, lots of stations, people can do CFD. They see very few wind tunnels, they very, very little time in wind tunnels. And the student comes out of a university having seen lots of quite flashy CFD being done and a couple of tatty old low speed wind tunnels down in the teaching lab. There are 40, I, I, there's something like 48 or so UK universities doing, doing um, aeronautical engineering. They've all got low speed wind tunnels, but most of them are toy tunnels in corners. And that's what students come out of university knowing about. 
is toy tunnels that don't do very much against beautiful CFD. They've all got their, their, their licenses for um, fluent or whatever, and they can see all the jelly pictures. And that's, I think that then comes on into industry. Those people come in and they bring that mindset with them. We'll just do one last question. Yeah. Uh, given the general history and strength of the UK University of Research, why don't they have to walk bigger avenues? Um, you can't get funding for them. The EPSA won't fund them. Universities can't afford them. Uh, the university that had decent sized tunnels have tended to downsize. So we've lost, used to be, there were several more X company nine, by, nine foot by seven foot tunnels. Um, Manchester had a lovely site out of, out of town at Barton, a lot of good wind tunnels. That's all gone because um, Queen Mary lost wind tunnels when they rationalized their labs. The City University lost wind tunnels when they rationalized their labs. Wind tunnels take up a lot of, a lot of floor area. So in the last few years, they've gone because they, they, they're not cost effective. You make more money out of bums on seats in a lecture theatre than you do in a lab. Uh, and that, I've seen that happen. Um, and I think, I think fragmentation is the other side of it. Universities, an academic university is an academic on their own. People are very, you know, it's like herding cats trying to get academics to do I've been an academic, I know what it's like. You want to do your own thing, and also you want your money. You want to get your funding in. You don't want to share it with anybody else. So everyone does their own little bit. You look at this at NW Sheffield, there's lots of little wind tunnel projects going on, but there's no national coordination. So to build a big wind tunnel costs a lot of money. And it's not sexy like high energy physics anymore. People think they're old. You forget if you get a lot of money to build a high energy physics lab, you get quite a lot of money to build a hypersonic capability at Oxford. They are that is that is happening, some decent hypersonics capabilities. Um, because that again is flavor of the month. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think again, if you can, I will get back to anybody who's asked questions online. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, if you pass them on, I can I can answer those people yeah, individually. Yeah, obviously, yeah, we should be able to uh, yeah. the chat. I think that's yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We will just uh, everyone on the chat, we will try and, um, yeah, but if no, it's happy to answer people, it's a little bit interesting. How that's a bit, yeah. And I know those of you who are coming via LinkedIn, you've seen if send me a message. And uh, hello. If, you're, if, you've got, if, you, if, you, you, if you disagree with me, please tell me. I'm happy to have an argument or a discussion about, uh, about wind tunnels. If, if I've got something wrong, please tell me, because it, you'd be amazed how difficult it is to find out some of this information. I think one of the reasons why you don't see these talks about numbers of wind tunnels is the data is buried all over the place. Uh, Chinese tunnels are particularly difficult, but even some of the American tunnels trying to keep track of which, which tunnel went where, because they kept changing names. As other companies change, tunnels change, um, and then they move them. So it's it's there will be mistakes in there. So I would really appreciate that. But also, um, there's the associated paper which is now online at the Aeronautical Journal. Um, it's come up on first view, so that's there for you to have a look at. And again, if I've got something wrong about your favourite wind tunnel, please let me know. I'm quite happy to correct it. Um, I did my best. I'm not a historian, um, and, and uh, there will be errors in there. But I also will answer everybody's questions in slow time. So, um, calls to me to uh, to do the uh, the vote of thanks. Um, really surprisingly, Doug, uh, we've run over time. Oh. With you. <laughs> I've never have known that with you, Doug. Um, and I had loads of copious notes here, but actually we. have Pretty much all the bits of notes that I'd made, I think, were then covered in the in the after chat, uh, and I'll I'll try and make this reasonably quick. Um, clearly, lots of short term thinking in the UK, lots of strategic thinking around the world. Wind tunnels are not the only thing where where this happens, but it, it's a national trait, isn't it? Or yeah. has been for the last uh, thirty or forty years. Um, the, the the one really big takeaway that, that you sort of alluded to early on is in wind tunnels, size matters. Um, I don't think I can say much more than that. I think it's been a, a fascinating, fascinating talk. Um, I think the, the number of uh, people that we had on Zoom shows that the, the subject matter is really, really interesting. And most of them have stayed, so they must have found it reasonably interesting or they couldn't find the leave button. Uh, we've got an audience in for the first time in, in well over a year, which is fantastic. Um, we've really enjoyed it. And for those of you who are, who are in the room, uh, join me in thanking Doug for a really excellent lecture.